Welcome to Warwick Words History Festival, the digital version for 2020. We're recording this interview on Zoom, which is a new experience for all of us. So if we've got any hiccups, please forgive us. The learning curve in this new digital age is very steep. I'm Neela Mann, Director of Warwick Words, uh, living in Cheltenham. And my guest today uh, from London is Isenda Max Tone Graham. Welcome to Warwick Words. Isenda is the author of British Summertime Begins, the School Summer Holidays 1930 to 1980, which has recently been the BBC Radio 4's Book of the Week. It's a book which Isenda describes as the non-fiction famous five, and she's quite emphatic that it is not just about summer holidays, but the summer holidays. Isenda, you've chosen a very specific time frame of 50 years, 1930 to 1980 for the school summer holidays. Why, why so? Well, why, I why those 50 years? Eight, yes, well, I really wanted this to be my, my, my way of writing social history is very much by talking to people. And I wanted to talk to people who were who, who remember remember the 1930s particularly because I wanted to hear what it was like in 1939 summer of 1939 I was very interested to know about what it was like in that August and September just before war was going to be broken up was going to be declared um that, so that's why I started 1930 when I went to 1980 my previous book about girls boarding schools went to 1979 which I named as the era of the, the age of the duvet when the duvet came into into fashion and and, and sheets and on were banished for life. Um, 1980, I thought, for this book was when computer games started. I think the first Binetone Tennis, which was um, a hopeless little little computer game, <laughs> where you hit a ping pong ball across. Yeah. That's in the late 1970s, and yeah. about 1980, people were beginning to have personal computers, and that, in a way, was the end of the summer, as the kind of summer I was describing, which was very much the pre screen. Yes, it certainly has appealed to uh, a lot of my generation. Uh, your previous book that you've mentioned, Terms and Conditions, uh, which I think was a brilliant title, uh, was about life in girls' boarding schools uh, between the 1940s to the 70s. But this book is broader in that it relates to the childhood experiences of all classes of society. East Enders, Durham Miners, Suffolk Farmers, and a sprinkling of the aristocracy. Uh, some of the contributors are familiar to us, um, although you say they weren't famous when they were children. Now, tell us, how did you gather your research? Mm, that's a good question, because it is hard. Of course, one could interview millions and millions of people for a book like this. And I, mm. that every now and then, I, I used to go past the outskirts of Leicester to get, ah, I haven't interviewed any of these people. How can I go <laughs> to the subject? But I just, I did try to cut, cut, touch all four corners and the middle of, of Britain. Um, and I really had a geographical sense of wanting to talk to people in Devon and Sunderland and Scotland and Ireland and East Anglia and the Midlands and the, the Northwest. <laughs> Um, so how did you how did you find these people? It was all organically. I just really kept my ear to the ground and and was so happy to find some a lovely man in Sunderland who happened to be the great defender of the metric martyrs called Neil Heron. He was wonderful and told me his his about his summers going up into the the Weir Valley. Um, and one person to, told me about another. And I I did try to cross the social spectrum, as you say. The boarding schools book was a bit more was definitely more middle class and upper class, I suppose, because of the nature of boarding schools. This one I wanted to really have in the same chapter, hot pickers and, well, dukes and hot pickers. And, and yes, it's it, it, yeah. to find those two. It's not often one gets a chance to see how similar, in a way, those, those, the experiences of those two were in some ways. Yeah, especially, for example, Dennis Skinner, when he, uh, the, the running, the freedom of the running up and down the slag heaps, and, you know, and you, you, you get the same thing with, with people who are, uh, aristocracy and they're they're running around the estates uh, exactly the, the, yeah yeah uh, one of the questions that you asked your contributors was uh, tell me about the non-events of your childhood summers as well as the events uh, when you set out doing the research uh, did the tales that you were told fit in with what you expected hmm, that's interesting because you have to write a, an outline nowadays when you well probably always have when you submit yeah, it yeah so I have to sort you have to sort of tentatively imagine how the book might go and so you sort of have to invent your themes and and then but the danger is then you try too hard to fit in what you find out to what your original outline was and I I did try not to do that in a way to let it to let the themes really emerge when I started talking to people um I thought I, there might be a chapter on 
clothes, what one wore, hand-me-downs, for example. But then my, one of my first interviews was with Libby Purvis, who told me about the, um, not that she'd had the same swimming towel, not only through her whole childhood, but through her whole life. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and that that sort of started a theme, which I, I then called the lack of the lack of luxury, as opposed yes. to luxury. The, sex of, the same swimming towel, the one swimming costume for summer, um, and and very much just not the, the lack of glamour really, in all across all classes. So that became a theme that I didn't know was going to emerge. Um, yes, I I like the story about the the girl who uh, at the beginning of every summer holiday had to unravel the knitted jumper that her mother had done so that she could knit her one slightly larger size. That's really there are quite quite a few things about clothes that come in. Are, are there not? You know the the summer clothes. I mean, I I can remember from my own my own childhood, we had um, ladybird t-shirts. Yes. I don't uh, that that they were that these were, patterns they came in different colours and my 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 brother had one set of colours and I had another set of colours and it it certainly did rake up a few things like the uh, the only time um, that uh, th this particular item of clothing came out uh, was was the summer time the holidays in Cornwall where I had a, a wool would you leave for summer a dark green wool pair of shorts. It, they were horrendous, and I, I can still feel that ghastliness of them. Um, parents didn't seem to have any idea of what kind of clothes you should be wearing. Yeah. But um, the book covers uh, six six parts in the book, covering people, places, and holidays. But uh, it begins with the words, when you step into that balmy ocean of time in mid-July, so it starts us on that journey in mid-July. Oh, Mid-July, end of summer term. I mean, don't you remember that sense of mad excitement at, the, at school? And, I mean, chaos, chaos really started to reign, didn't it, in the classroom? I mean, it was very hard <laughs> <laughs> to start to keep yes. it with things. As I start saying in my first paragraph, that really was when um, pe people pushed the boundaries. Um, and we have m amazing descriptions of what went on. Um, the girls of Benedict stealing the headmistress's West Highland white and dyeing it pink. Um, <laughs> And just, you know, really being, doing very, very naughty. But it all because of the, the mad excitement, the windows open, the smell of the mown grass. You just wanted to get out there. You couldn't take yes. lessons anymore. Some schools really took no notice of this and carried on the lessons till the bitter end. Other, others got a bit more lax and started doing hangman, games of hangman in the classroom and things. All of the, and, um, just that, that sense of the, the, the final hymn, the, 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 the singing Jerusalem on the last day of <sighs> or Lord dismiss us with thy blessing. And, and then yeah. the door swinging open and out you went into this, into this balmy ocean of time, this sense of infinity. I mean, you couldn't imagine September, could you? It just seemed like you had a, a lifetime ahead of you. And mm. that, in a way, what, what went on in that? What went on in those empty, empty weeks? Because when they, they, usually there weren't, there weren't things in the diary. You just went, out, went, went home to emptiness, freedom. And what, yeah. you know, what did that consist of? I thought I'd find out. There are a lot of stories in the book about, um, uh, sort of to the start, uh, about uh, boarding school ex experiences, uh, especially trunks that uh, people packed. Yes, the smell of the trunk. The smell of the trunk at the end of the summer term being the most delicious smell in the world. Mm. At the end of the summer holidays being the most disgusting smell in the world. You know, that, that same leathery smell could either mean we're going to pack our trunks and go home or, oh, we've got to pack our trunks and go back. So yes. We're feeling very much, it's that time of year now, isn't it? And so, so it was a, a different, a different kind of experience for um, boarding school. There's yeah, lots of yeah. different kinds of experiences from for the boarding school uh, well, the pupils. Day boys, day boys, of course, and day girls went straight back to the house they'd left. Mm. Very, as I said, they done might done a paper round that very morning, and they did one a paper round 364 days a year. Um, yeah. I later heard that it wasn't on Christmas Day they didn't do it; it was on New Year's Day. They did do one on Christmas Day. Yes. Yeah. So, and so for them, it was less, in a way less exciting, perhaps, to go back to the same house they had breakfast in. But it was still a wonderful feeling of, of, of different. It's a very different feeling when you're going back and term is over and you can just throw off those black shoes. Yes. Cotton shorts or woolen shorts in your case. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that, those shorts only came out uh, for the summer holidays. I didn't have to wear them the rest of the time. And just the, 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 the going, going to Cornwall. But I, I, I actually went to a boarding school, but um, I was a day pupil. And, and I, I know that most of the girls that I was at boarding school with uh, were army families. And the experiences in your book about 
the girls from army families is quite interesting and long journeys home and having to go yes to yes for a label around their neck and be corralled at airports and railway stations onto strange vessels that took them country to country to get home yeah. to a completely different world and and the parents that they met who they barely knew that was yes there was one extraordinary story of steph who who yes who hadn't seen her parents for six months and came walked into their increasingly unhappy marriage and and had to find a way of dealing with that that's the long summers in this household and thank in the, for her the freedom to get out was an absolute lifeline and i think this was true for lots of british children too actually the well, we're going to talk about freedom later, aren't we? That, that, that yes, is, we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yes. Um, you describe that summer holiday state as being kinetic stasis, which uh, Laura Thompson, who um, we we had on Warwick Words a couple of years ago, in her review calls doing nothing, but internally humming and whirring. Uh, can you explain it? Yeah. Well, I was trying to write about stasis, and I just thought it wasn't quite the right word because you were static in terms of not really going more than half a mile from your or a mile's back radius from your house but actually you were non-stop running about mentally and, and mentally mentally and physically humming and whirring as laura put it and and i want to describe that, that, that just climbing the trees any tree you could find running down the alleys near, near your near your house um inventing incredibly complicated games of dice cricket or imaginary schools and there, there was it was yes kinetic stasis i think was quite a quite an apt expression to, to express that sort of sense of Staying yes, yeah, and, and it also um, there's this vast chunks of time which um, uh, you know what what on earth are you going to do with it as you say? Um, it, some some were quite lonely and and some were as you say alarmingly solitary. But it's this vast amount of time that is yours is yeah. yours to play with. Um, so nowadays, parents do sort of over perhaps over organise this so much. The next week, and you know, really, that this was—I think parents were far more neglectful, and they—you were just given, you just woke up with a, a day, and and and, and no screens, so you had to fill. And I, and I, I, I sort of suggest that whatever you did, you, you did interminably. So you, if you had mm. one strange little thing you were doing, you asked about the non-events of childhood. I mean, there are some marvelous ones like just setting off on a your bicycles, doing one kick on your bicycle and then doing the rest of having to get to the end of the road without touching the pedals. Yes. I, could get. I mean, a really silly task, like, or not task, challenge like that could just take up a whole morning. Yeah. On a, on, a, on, a, on a roundabout and trying to pick up a lolly stick off the ground, you know, just ridiculous things. But, but they, you know, mm. you'll probably learn quite a few motor skills from that, I should imagine. Yes, yeah. It's. Uh, I'd like to explore a bit this this idea of time. This this because it's as as adults, we are very regimented. Maybe not quite so much now of lockdown, which has been quite strange in that respect. Um, I never know which day of the week it is, for example, unless I pick up the newspaper. But and and in actual fact, that was very similar to to the childhood experiences that they they had. Many of them had no routine. They had gone from this regimented, noisy school environment into this complete um, emptiness of time. Yes, Simon Winder describes just sitting, like sitting on the sofa for you know hours of every day, reading at funny angles. He called it reading at funny angles, sort of lying upside down on the sofa. Yes, act of light on the carpet, and in, in, in just just the absolute stillness and silence after the din of term time. And some found this delicious. Other found others found it rather rather panic inducing, having they'd lost their jolly, the jollity of school and were suddenly only children were suddenly at home with with perhaps no company mm. at all. And of course, the, the the children who who had been in boarding school had had lost their their close friendship. They're now back in in a society where they probably didn't know many children. So that's another side effect of boarding school that, that parents, I think, didn't think of. I said in terms and conditions that parents didn't obviously didn't often think that hard about whether the school was absolutely suitable for their particular daughter, um, who might mm. be very sent to a really horsey or sporty school or vice versa. Um, and and I think that um, they didn't also think about you know the, the effect of just being sent away and then you come home and you don't know you don't, don't know your neighbours anymore and I, I spoke to some lovely man in the who lived in Ricelip very very lonely because he, he didn't have he lost touch with all his childhood friends mm, mm. and the, there was uh, the one girl who who actually realised that she didn't know her father because she didn't actually talk to him until she was 16 
Well, there's a whole chapter on fathers in, in the book. I, I, yeah. I, a section called The People You Were Stuck With. And that's not something <laughs> about what I was surprised by. I didn't really realise there was going to be this section on members of the different family members, but I thought it was quite important to have to, to, to describe the roles of mothers and fathers, which were so much more separate in those days. And I think the fathers were really, from what I gathered from lots of people, sort of shut themselves away and or, took August off, shut themselves away in their workshop or <laughs> study to do their whatever they were working on, expected like, meals to be to be served at one, one o'clock. And <laughs> didn't, didn't, some didn't have much to do with their, their, their children. Others were really marvellous figures of, of, of mystique who, taught them how to make do things in woodwork and read stories out loud and took them camping so but there was a sort of mystique about fathers definitely yeah and fathers uh, as you say made things mm, yeah like so, like like cricket balls out of elastic bands <laughs> and things get quite as much credit as they deserve because they were in fact keeping the whole show on the road yes dressing the wounds with um, horrible bubbly calamine lotion or something not you know in, yet sticking plasters do you, on do you think they were do you or, or do you they, think they just gave that impression <laughs> I, I think they, they I, I did talk to people whose mothers who had very good jobs during term time the moment the holidays began they had to stop those jobs and just become drudges of the of, the, of usually rather a chaotically cut tumble down country cottage in Berkshire, mm. um, and, and where the washing machine kept breaking not much fun really and endless yes. of weeding the flower beds not 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 so perhaps they like the, the roles did seem to be more 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 delineated then than they are now which is for better and for worse i mean looking back on it it it's it's like a completely different planet the, the relationship between parents um mm. when i when i think of me as a parent i mean my my boy is now um well my eldest is 40 this year heavens above um and i i think of how my parents were to me um yeah. you, you know don't speak at the table and uh etc and and father got served first because uh, i remember asking my mother why and she said um because he he's the one who brings the money and so he has to be served first and i think of yeah. how how our lives are now yes. you do I'm, um, I'm, scared it, it, of, I'm scared of having empty diary days with my young children oh we've got to we've got to fill it in we've got to have something to do that day because i suppose we are london and now of course we have the danger we have the screen danger which we so parents have to work hard to push against that absolute mm. epic pull of the screen and that's why parents have to be so busy now to make things happen get out get them out home has yes. become a more dangerous place to be and yes but it, it, I think it highlights the the, the different generations. Yes. And, um, there's a bigger gap, I feel, between uh, my parents and, and myself as a parent than, than there is between me as a parent and my children as parents. Their, their, their parenthood is very similar to mine. Um, yes. uh, but uh, it, it is, in that respect, your book is, is actually bringing out um, the... the showing the result of uh, our parents having Victorian parents and those influences. Uh, they, they were brought up having had really quite in, very, very stuck indoors childhood. Some, some people I spoke to hadn't been allowed, you know, their, their own parents hadn't been allowed out at all. So mm. they were just trying to give that freedom that they hadn't been allowed. Yes, and, uh, and it, it, there are also, um, within the book, there are a lot of uh, phrases that uh, I, I've completely forgotten about now. Run along, dear. <laughs> and, yes. Go and, uh, yeah, go and run your head along the railings. That'll, yes, that's a, a lovely cockney man I spoke to. But I said, go and run your head along the railings. That'll sort you out. <laughs> you say you're bored. Go and clean your hair. Go and do a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yes, really lovely. Now, um, I, as I quote, the calibre of children's summers in the mid-20th century depended not on whether you were rich or poor, but on whether the doors were open or closed. Uh, th this theme of, of freedom is, is um, common throughout your stories. Um, I particularly like the stories of Boris Johnson's um, sister, Rachel, uh, telling while staying with her grandparents on an Exmoor farm, they seem to have a wonderful freedom of life, uh, a life of grubby knees and unbrushed hair, so we know where Boris gets it from. But if you can talk about this, this idea of doors open or closed and you know, porous houses and children passing through. I think porous, porousness was more of a theme of the book than I realised it was going to be as well. Porousness of, of houses and the, the doors were open at both ends. It, it, it's that, uh, and, and I say, suggest that the poorer children were 
you know, the, the less money you had in a way, the more freedom because those doors were, there was nothing to steal really. I spoke to people who lived brought up in Belfast and they just said, that, but we were just out and ran in, ran in for meals, ran into other people's houses uh, and, and that, that, that extraordinary freedom. Um, and um, I, I compare a very, I do compare a sort of De Dennis Skinner with his open doors in Clay, Clay Cross in Derbyshire, his mother singing in the kitchen, to Malcolm Innes, who's the Lord Land King of Arms, brought up in a sort of castle, I think, in Scotland, um, also with the doors open at both ends, um, and, and, and also no cars, because it, you know, they were, the cars were on, were on mm. Mm. out of service during the war. So both of them had that real similar kind of freedom with doors at both ends. I suggest that Dennis Skinner had more interaction with the real world because he was in a town and ran, running up slag heaps, whereas the people in their private grounds were just running, were just getting to know the, 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 their own private world. Um, but how important, <laughs> and, and I yes, I talked to one of the man in Belfast, remember the dreadful day when the police came round after when the IRA bombing started and said, you've got to keep your doors closed from now on. And he said, mm. that was a terrible, terrible end of what we'd known. That was 1974, yes. I think. Yeah. Um, th this um, free freedom was such, in some areas though, where people had boundaries. You weren't allowed to go to beyond the end of your street in, unless you had your mother's permission. Yeah. And this was basically a town thing, wasn't it? There's very much a difference between the town and the country experience. It, it, it wasn't running across the whole city. I and mean, I spoke to people brought up in my area of Fulham who said they never ever went even central London the whole childhood. They just, they, they, one said there was a, a, there was Jesus on the cross at the end of my street. And I felt he was <laughs> um, if I went, went beyond the, the next road. So yeah. Yeah, there, there were boundaries of that kind. But they weren't running absolutely wild um, in mm. the town. I suppose in the country they could go as far as they liked. And, and the games that that were played, were, the, the town games weren't necessarily the country games, like the people on the country estates would just disappear into the countryside and do whatever, fishing, whatever they did. But the, those in the towns, they they had particular games and they made their games in their, their, their confined spaces. Well, did, like not running, not run, ring the doorbell and running away, of course, with an absolute <laughs> favourite and, and hopscotch. And, and if there's one little muddy puddle, spending the whole afternoon just going on an old rusty bicycle through the muddy puddle and over and over and over again. Um, yes. You know, I just, I mean, one thing I do mention in, towards the end of the book is that I, I don't see that, I don't see children, yeah, I don't see children doing that. I'm, I'm, I, look, I look in vain for this kind of thing nowadays. I mean, this summer, mm. having cycled around the whole way to London, I'm just overjoyed when I saw two children, two sisters, stuck in their garden because they had only each other to play with because there was lockdown, make, playing with a huge cardboard box and making a house out of it. Um, yes. And I, I, how often, how rarely does one see people in the children in the, in the countryside, as they call it, playing in a playing in a stream without parental attention? I mean, this used to happen all the time, I think. And so many, I, I, so many people told me this, so I, they couldn't have been making it up. It was, yes, it uh, but but the games that that children played are not the same games that they play now. Everything is supplied for them. But I, I uh, in in your book, you you bring up things like marbles playing marbles yeah. and and the uh, the boy who thought that the bsa on his bicycle was uh, um it's about sticking bits on yeah, exactly it's making your own bag i mean how clever is that at the age of 11 to be able to get a bit yes. of a route from here and a chain from the bottom of the river and a, some ball bearings that you put into your mother's lard in order to get them sort of softening again and and make, make a bike i mean you know that i i, I do suggest that amazing self-education was going on i mean the physics of building a bike was just mm. being and without being taught, without being having to go to on a physics course, um, you're just in fact learning how, how things worked. Yes, yes. Lucinda, uh, another part of your book is something that you've already mentioned. You, you talk about um, the people you're stuck with. Um, your book is a fascinating record of social history um, and the roles people play in children's lives and, and how families functioned. Um, you, you say mothers were loved uh, and taken for granted and fathers were adored and revered. Um, but as we've talked a little earlier about the del delineation of roles of parents in particular, um, you, you've got, you, you bring in other people, for example, um, the, gr the grandparents, um, uh, one wonderful, uh, ev ev evocative grandparents who offer that different kind of love and the multiple uh, aunties and uncles. Um, 
Can you explain further about the, the roles people played in children's lives? Hmm, well, we have slightly talked about m mothers and fathers, but like, mm. again, I didn't really realise I was going to have to have this grandparents chapter when I wrote my outline. I don't think it was there, but it just became such a running theme. Of the, yes. We never went, well, as we'll soon see, never went abroad and hardly went on holidays. The, the one, their one experience of going somewhere else was to go and stay with their grandparents and what a amazingly wonderful and part of and, and st stability inducing part of um, childhood that was to go and stay with these other people who who loved you and who weren't your own parents and, mm. and the ordinary rituals of grandparents houses people could, uh, people described their grandparents houses with such love they took me as it were around every single room in the grandparents houses the smell of the pantry and the, the larder and the, yes and the, and the way their grandparents had to have nap had to have a nap after lunch. You had to tiptoe about the house in the, in the, between one and three, and and uh, you know, and I thought it was a very important part of summer. Also, because quite often, the, sometimes the mothers went with the children, stay with the grand, stay with the grandparents. So two two generations were in a cocoon. The mother and the children were were were, were, were being looked after by this older generation. Mm. Um, some mothers who found motherhood hard, or perhaps who were divorced, or had, had had other kinds of trouble to going to the, going to the, this other older generation was a very important and wonderful lifeline. Yes, yeah, the the um, uh, other I have it here a miraculous extra dimension of love mm. that is so nice. Yeah. But it's obviously, you know, I, I, uh, some people, you know, you might expect to rather misery a misery this book to be a misery memoir, but more and more I really found it wasn't. I really found that in general there was this. Mm. this of happiness about it and going to stay with grandparents was part of that even though some some found it rather hard to go and stay with these geriatrics who had their who put, and having to push their trolleys about and and <laughs> very very set ways could was quite hard and quite lonely but generally it was a a, a wonderful experience and i really wanted yes to that. It, it made me think of um jocelyn dimbleby who um the the cookery writer who who actually was brought up quite a lot by her grandmother in London because her grand her parents were in the diplomatic service yeah. and her grandmother used to take her to places like Fortnum and Mason and she would explain all the food to her and that's where she got that and the, and the fact that her her parents were um, stationed in places like Damascus um, etc in Egypt. Yeah, so I met Sally Terrace who's in my book was also brought up pretty well brought up by her grandmother with her sister mm. Alcoholic, and then brought up in Sheffield in this wonderfully regimented but happy household where everything was like clockwork. Tea was served at mm. a hot meal with tea, and the absolutely she described the thrill of going to the laundrette with her grandmother when the laundrette mm. opened in, in Walkley, which was a bit part of Sheffield. The absolute excitement of this absolute wonderful ritual of walking to the laundrette via the shop so they could pick up comics. And sitting and watching the watching the washing going round and round, and said it, there's a lovely warm feeling about it all, and it's why I, it's why I still enjoy doing washing. <laughs> Yes, and I think um, some of the things that the children remember are, are these special things that the routine that, that the grandparents had. Not particularly, not particularly glamorous or exciting, not going to the theatre, not going to, not, not, you know, not doing anything particularly exciting, just can go to the laundrette or going to the egg, going to, lots remember going to fetch the eggs from the hens. Yes. Grandmothers seem to keep hens more than they do now. And <laughs> weighing each egg were part of the great excitement of it yes and and um the other ev evocative thing um about the grandparents seemed to be the smells the uh, um the lavender the silver polish the you know etc that uh, the smells of the house and as you say people could go through whole rooms of the house describing it I'll come back to you i mean the proustians if you smell a certain polish you're right back there yes um, and uh, talking to friends the, the other day about your book, um, I said, uh, who remembers the Mivy? Oh, the Mivy ice creams, you know, etc. Talking about grandparents, I'd like to digress for a, a bit because um, your own grandmother, Arthur, who wrote under the pseudonym of Jan Struther, uh, she wrote the Mrs. Miniver column in the in the Times newspaper, which was the goings on of an ordinary sort of woman who leads an ordinary sort of life. But in fact, she didn't, did she? Uh, you, and, and in fact, you've written a, a biography of her, although she died before you were born. Can you? Um, is this chronicling of social history in your blood? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so 
she, I, I wish I'd met her. She, I've got her first edition of Mrs. Miniver here, and I was just looking at it, at it today, and it starts with the oh. end of the year, actually, putting the summer back into its box, one of her favourite yeah. moments of the year, and she said that this is the real new year, that, 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 that tedious affair in January is nothing but a name. The real new yeah. year. And that end of summer is very strong. And yes, no, and, I, and I, I, I wrote a biography, and it was shortlisted for Whitbread Prize in 2001, and it was a wonderful thing to, to do. And I, I came across a, a, an amazing box of letters that she'd written to the man she fell in love with after. She yes. A healthy housewife. She, because she, she, went, she went off to America, didn't she? She was, as a, as a kind of ambassadress for Britain, she was, the, you know, because the, the film came out in 1942. It was a, it did a, did a lot to help America understand what... what and it, it must have given you an insight into your grandparent, your grandmother, who, that you, of course, you could never have known. Yes, I knew her very, very well. She lived two miles up the road, up the King's Road from me, and I always wait. <laughs> Maybe her I cycle past her square, which is, and I'd have loved to have met her. Um, she was an incredible free spirit um, and, and a brilliant observer of small details. I think maybe I've inherited that because we both love ordinary humdrum details of everyday ordinary life that we find beautiful. And, and, one, and, and she used to look at, love looking out of train windows at back gardens, which I also love. Oh, yes, me too. <laughs> Seeing a little glimpse yeah. of people's lives. And, and, and yeah. It's really important to her. So I, I do feel we were, we were kindred spirits and she, she had quite a few granddaughters and I feel we all have that in in common and she also yes. wrote, she wrote the hymn Lord of all hope from the Lord of all yeah, yeah. even though she wasn't particularly church going I have to say but she did have a sort of amazing affinity with um with, with all that and and, and the sort of religious sort of numinous sense and she wrote those amazing words oh amazing yeah and uh, so what memories of your own childhood have you brought to the book well, good question. So I didn't. I really didn't not want it to be about all about me. But every, mm. now, and every now and then, I couldn't put, resist putting little bits in. So I think I mentioned the fact that I longed to go to this place called the Umbrellas, which was a um, a, a, a motorway service station above the M2, <laughs> which seemed unbelievably glamorous because it had umbrellas along the bridge, over the yeah. road, over the carriageways, and you could sit up there and have a look at all the cars going by underneath. And my parents, of course, being typical 1960s, 70s parents, weren't that keen on going out to restaurants, as I describe in the book quite often, that um, restaurants were an amazingly rare treat. Um, and we, you know, it wasn't the dumb thing to stop at, stop at service stations for uh, fish and chips. You jolly well had ham sandwiches. Yes, uh, you, you mentioned um, Judith Kerr's book, The Tiger Who Came to Tea. Mm -hmm. But how, how some people were when they discovered that they went out to yes. have a meal afterwards. No. In the, when the cafe in the evening it was so exciting to read about. So I mentioned yes. that. I also mentioned my grandmother because she she was just she was Austrian. She, my mother was an Austrian refugee. Actually, she came over when she was five with her parents from um, Nazi Germany. And and my grandmother said in her lovely Austrian accent, "I will. I'm, go, I'm going to put you to bed now, but you'll hear me clattering the dishes as I wash up down down the down the corridor. So you'll you'll be able to hear that noise." And it was such a <laughs> such a grandmotherly comforting thing to say that I I couldn't yes. resist. Um, yes, it, it, it's uh, it's quite interesting, um, as I say, being a grandmother myself to a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old, and 10-year-old I more or less bring up, is trying to give him the experiences that one, I enjoyed, and two, that I think that he would enjoy. It, it's it's quite quite fun. I enjoy the, I enjoy the role. Uh, I don't get too much of myself. I, my husband, I have to say, comes in quite a lot because he had a really classic, classic childhood of being the middle boy, the back of the car, squished in. Um, in the back garden all summer, just playing cricket with his brothers in the back garden. I think I, he really did give me a lot of. He, yes. This was, a, this was a worthy subject to write about because it was uh, the childhood of so many people. This sort of very mm. much at home, and and they they had to go out into the fresh air every single all day every day. Mother had a thing about fresh air, and I think mothers did have a thing about fresh air. They did. They do now. Yes. And um, <laughs> so, was your was your husband the one who is parents when the, the two siblings or the three in his case were arguing in the back of the car said you you know you will talk now you don't have to talk when you're adults you won't have to see each other at all when you're growing up but you do now so <laughs> right. <laughs> right now places places of course are of great importance I, I've, I've got a a, a, a little piece I'd like to read out from your book which I particularly love is to show the, the kind of length of journeys that, that people went even in this country and it's Joe Rotner as you say now Lord Lieutenant of North Yorkshire uh, to get to her family's shooting lodge in Peyton Moona estate in Inverness 
you drove northwest from Inverness for an hour through Bewley and Strewey, and then you went through a padlock gate into Glenstrath Forer, then 12 miles more along a single track road till you reached the east end of Loch Mona. Then you left the car and did the final 10 miles to the other end of the lock in a boat, a big diesel Noah's Ark called Cleopatra. Then we piled the luggage and supplies into an old Land Rover and the children had to walk the final mile to the lodge, whatever the weather. The venison and grouse were kept in a freezer at the nearest electricity point, 10 miles away at the other end of the lock. Mm. Hello, Mona, can you hear me? Over, her mother said on the radio telephone each morning, a sort of wall-mounted walkie-talkie. Please you take that leg of venison and a loaf of bread out of the freezer, send it up today. Thank you, over and out. I love that. Yeah, I mean, you would have thought you would get so remote in, in Britain. You know, that, that, yes. Uh, I think people talk about La France Profonde is one of the things people you know, talk about in France. But there is an Angleterre Profonde, I think, where you're so far from, you can get very, very far from civilization in those wilds of North Scotland. And I wanted to, I think there's, there's a chapter in my book called August Retreats, these places where you went far, far away from civilization. And even more, you could retreat into yourself on these long days of walking. Yes, I, when my boys were small, we used to uh, go to the Isle of Rase, which mm. is off the east coast of Sky, and this is before they had um, the Sky Bridge. Yes, and it would take us two days, um, and we would stay overnight in Fort William. And um, you know, these journeys became ritual, amazing ritual things. We probably did the journey, same journey. Yes, as we yes, yes. Uh, and then when we got to, to the cottage on Rase. Um, there was, as you would say, nothing to do, but that didn't worry them. They just disappeared off. Mm -hmm. And my my youngest son and uh, has um, we, we've gone back twice with his uh, small child now because we just he just loved the experience of it. And I have to say, it hasn't changed. It's exactly as wet and as mid-ridden as it always was. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe yes, Richard, Richard in Scotland. Uh, so, um, the, the stories of uh, going away, staying in the holidays with school friends, uh, the multiple aunts, um, and, then, and then there's the summer holidays and the rituals, uh, the quirks. Uh, can you tell us some of these? The, journey, then the journeys, the packing, the preparing for journeys. I loved hearing about people spending a week, you know, father spending a week practicing. I had a father who practiced loading the car on the night before the journey, did a dummy run of packing the car, so put, just to make sure all the luggage would fit in, took it all out in case, was, in case someone drove off in the night, and then repacked it on the morning of departure. And yes. Going in convoy, and the grandparents thinking, in this convoy, the grandparents thinking you had to warm up the car before you left, so they <laughs> revving the engine 10 minutes before departure, according clouds of exhaust fumes, off everybody went down these A-roads, playing dice, playing that game of how many legs on a pub sign. So if it was the king's head, you got no legs, but if it was a horse and coach and horses, you got many, many. Oh, these yeah. amazing ritual games and stopping in the very same lay-by for coffee and biscuits every single year. That's right. And, and on our journeys down to Cornwall, we used to stop on Sedgemoor uh -huh. and um, out would come the Huntley and Palmer's biscuit <laughs> tin. Uh, with the uh, methylated spirit primer stove mm -hmm. and my mother would cook for five of us yes. a full English breakfast. I, mean, I bet nothing tasted as good as that I'm afraid. I mean you know, it really must be delicious. Yeah and, and tea was tasted in methylated spirit. <laughs> Simply food it wouldn't quite be as it's not quite as exciting is it? Uh, uh, the, the, um, I did love all these rituals but as for then of course uh, against that was the, the terrible sinky suspension of the cars this i mean co constant feeling <laughs> being, yes. i mean many um i heard about you know just cars so full up that they had to only way to fit, was to un undo the undo the um sleeping bags and we had to sit on top of about five sleeping bags as the only yes. way of you know just to fitting fitting the children in and and the, and, and the sort of stench of banana sandwiches and vomit really yeah, yeah. Um, and and it was always me who had to s sit in the in the the well at the feet of everybody at the back because I was the smallest one. And this is pre pre safety belts, I suppose. Yes. Um, 
I can relate very much to the the story of the the father with the Pevsna, uh, the yes. book of interesting architecture, um, who had a compulsion to go into churches. Um, not only did we have to stop off at the Catholic Church in Glastonbury, but we would never be allowed to go into any other church unless it was Catholic, which is particularly sad because of um, John Betjeman's um, church at uh, uh, St. Enadog uh, Rock. Uh, and we, weren't, we, were, we were allowed to look at it, but we weren't allowed to go in because it was a Protestant yeah, church. That's very good. Yes, I haven't heard that before, but gosh, exactly, going into, going into churches. Well, I, uh, yes, again, maybe I suggested that perhaps nowadays mothers perhaps need the holidays more. And those days, I do feel it was more the fathers decided, we're going to go on this walk, we're going to look in this church. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, quite. Yeah. Um, then there's the holiday abroad. Oh, gosh. Well, I, I tried to shape the book almost like a like a child like a summer in it, by the time you get abroad which is one of my later chapters you're just gagging for it get me, yes. out of it. Get me abroad because you know and, that, and that's why there's that comes quite late in the book the great moment of crossing the channel and that, that particular feeling about the the ferry the ferry oh, is is ferry. the massive yeah, yeah, sort of re almost religious feeling as one person put it of crossing the water um, yes yes um I, I liked when you asked Nicholas Soames, Winston Churchill's uh, grandson, if he went abroad as a child, and he replied, certainly not. No one went abroad except to fight a war. I did like that. Well, a, a, lot, a lot of those parents will have had that kind of experience of um, having been uh, uh, through the war, and and some one did, one didn't... As, as, he, as he said, you didn't go except to fight. Well, well, there would have been the devastation in in France, etc. It, it it would have been quite a strange time for for some of these people, I think. The idea of a foreign holiday. Exactly, and then it became then then package holidays started to become popular in the nineteen sixties. And, and John Mullen, who was one of my interviews, said that his mother said to him when he begged, his, some children in his class were starting to go abroad, going to Mallorca, and he said, "Why can't we go there rather than just Suffolk?" And she said, "Darling, going abroad is vulgar." <laughs> yes. yes. Um, the, the, what were the experiences of uh, early foreign holidays? That's the story about. I mean, I, I like I, the, the, my favourite ones were sort of clergy and teachers who really wanted to discover abroad because they read a lot and thought about it and wanted to go and look around Gothic churches and classical ruins, but didn't have very much money, so they just took England with them, as it were, in the back of the car. Yeah. Um, Eleanor Aldroyd, the wonderful broadcaster, took um, said that they took. Um, a tin of baked beans for every single day of the holiday so that amounted to 21 tins of baked beans in the back of the car for a three-week holiday and baked beans were the accompanying vegetable every night to go yes. with that. Cot yes. uh, made on a primer stove cottage pie made out of a tin of Campbell's soup mixed with a tin of <laughs> 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 and 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 when her mother tried to substitute them for haricot um, blanc uh, a la sauce tomate, um, it was not accepted. It's, it's not accepted, I'm afraid. No, no, not at all. Um, that was charming, and people bringing their marmite with them. I mean, I think this is, that still happens, but that was I thought that was charming. And listening to the cricket, the, the, when you first arrived, the first thing the father did was put on the, the radio, yes. see if it, the cricket, and of course yes. that, that became fainter and fainter, and then you really were abroad once the cricket went. Yes, I had a, a brother-in-law who um, didn't mind going to uh, France, providing that he could have meat and two veg and no garlic. <laughs> 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 and I think that was fairly typical. And and the, the other thing about um, summer holidays is um, getting up really early to be ahead of the traffic. I think and everybody did it. They did, I think. Did they really? So, I mean, I think there was this thing called, I do collect theories in this book. Collect, I collect parent, mother's theories, father's theories and grandparents' theories. And fathers did have a thing about, we've got to get ahead of the traffic. And That's so right. Start at, start at, earlier and earlier. I mean, Tim Amos, lovely, um, who was put to bed in his camper van in the front drive in their pyjamas, children, so that the parents could then drive off at 3am to get <laughs> over for the first ferry. And this was all, he'll never forget that sort of just vaguely waking up at the sound of the car moving at 3am. And, and yes, yes. A real, I, mean, I don't think we're quite so obsessed with that now, are we? Um, well, I can remember um, waking up. I have no idea what time it was, but I, I can always remember that it was cold. Yeah. It was dark outside and there were moths. Hmm. That's my, my childhood memories of getting up early in the morning for going well, on holiday. Well, everyone was shivering with excitement and sort of lack of sleep. <laughs> very, very exciting. Not quite a standstill, but yeah. Hmm. Yes, um, we've 
only managed to touch the surface of the scope of your book. Um, um, and in the beginning, you say, how did those suns form us and shape the way we live the rest of our lives? Do you have an answer for that? Oh, gosh, well, that's a good question. I think that, I mean, I did think that you know, during lockdown, we who we who lived those summers <laughs> found it very easy. <laughs> <laughs> so used to, I mean, going past those, all those closed restaurants, closed Pizza Express, closed cafes. <laughs> well, there was no question of going to those places when we were young. So this is welcome to our childhood. <laughs> to bring our own ham sandwiches and Kit Kats. Um, yes. And, and we, I do feel that there is, you know, we are those that generation is more able to cope with, as it were, boredom. And yes. Days. Um, although you know, I think the young generation are able to cope with it, but it's often screen filled. It is more screen filled, of course. That that's yeah. the today's shop to boredom um and i i think that um people who grew up they, those days sort of tend to know they know the names of all the flowers and plants and trees and i feel that's something you just did by roaming about i say can, can the younger generation today tell the difference between a deadly nightshade berry and a black currant you know <laughs> <laughs> but i think you, know, you got it well could because we just used to go around noticing those things and we used to have the little books as well. Um, I mean, my, my, my childhood um, memory is I Spy books. Mm, oh, yes. On um, I, I Spy of uh, the Seaside, I Spy of whatever. Um, and the little observer books of... Yeah. of um, Dogs, uh, wildflowers. Wildflowers, yeah. yes. Um, that's how I learned to look at an index and use a book properly. And the children these days don't have the same thing. My husband has an app on his phone where he photographs a flower and, and it automatically comes up as to what it is. So my grandson, when we go and works, doesn't have that thing of looking at the pictures. They what they are. So I, respond, yes. I really feel that that gave us a certain amazing resilience and ability to deal with to, to, to deal mm. with today. Um, yes. Yeah. Sink, sink into ourselves when we need to and just absorbed yes yes uh, I, I know those of us who, who've read this book want to know what will you be writing about next oh, that I, ha I have signed a contract for a next book actually and I'm just getting started <laughs> I can't tell much about it but it is what happened I'm going to adulthood actually for the first time because these two books are more about childhood terms and conditions and British summertime this is what happened when you tumbled out of school at the age of 16 18 and started to try to make your way in the world of jobs and careers to what, oh. extent, to what extent this is it's going to be called jobs for the girls oh yeah. great like, well yeah. do get in touch um because we would love to uh, have you back uh, for that i think that'd be absolutely fascinating aerial courses dressmaking courses cookery courses <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so um it's in the uh Thank you so much for this, for joining us for Warwick Words Digital History Festival. It's been a delight to talk to you. And um, I would just say to everybody, I recommend you go down to Warwick Books straight away, buy this book for yourself and buy it for everyone else you know. So, um, have a look on, on our website for other interviews, etc. And um, Isenda Maxton Graham, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you. You too.